Jesus Christ is our Sabbath. Jesus Christ died for sinners. Though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. When Jesus Christ died, we died with him. We meet all the requirements of the law by faith. Today we're going to be looking at the book of 1 Samuel, one of the best, probably one of the most well-known stories in 1 Samuel, and that's the battle of David and Goliath. We've seen it in movies, we've seen it in cartoons, we've seen it in the dolls and all the kids' toys and everything. It's one of the most frequently taught Sunday school lessons to children. And this morning I want to take a look at it a bit in detail as well as look at some other verses as we touch on the topics of courage, fear, and the sovereignty of God. I'm doing it Friday, so just ignore that. So. Um, I can fix, no, I can't fix it. Never mind. We're in the wrong mode. Sorry about that. Uh, I must have been putting this slide together Friday. Anyway, so let's take a look at 1 Samuel. I've, I've kind of slightly edited it or re really rearranged it to, to keep it in, in certain order as we are going through it. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Succo, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Succo and Azekah in Ephesdamon, these great Old Testament words. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up a line in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley in between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. So we can see the scene here. We've got two mountains, valley in between. You've got Israel on one side, Philistines on the other. And out comes this man, this giant, said he was six cubits and a span. Now, they say a cubit is a measurement of the distance from your middle finger to your elbow. And so therefore, it can be anywhere roughly between 17 and 22 inches. A span, they say, is roughly 9 inches and is the measurement from the end of your thumb to the end of your pinky when you expand your hand up. So, uh, Goliath is said to have stood anywhere between roughly 9 foot 3 and some say as high as 11 foot 9. Uh, most people guesstimate him to be in the, in the 9 foot range, somewhere in that area. Now, this may sound pretty crazy to us these days, but back in that day, it was not so out of the ordinary. For even secular historians back in the day, like Herodotus and Diodorus Siculus and Pliny, these are some of the other strange writers back then, they wrote of persons as high as seven cubits, making them pretty much twice the size of a normal average height of a human. Now, as a, leaders, as a leader of the armies of Israel, the description of Saul places him as a very tall man himself. See, I was not doing the buttons like I should, so let me just catch up here. Saw a handsome man, young man, who was not a, there was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. For from his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. So Saul was not only one of the most handsome of men at the time, but was also the tallest among them of Israel, not obviously of the Philistines. <clears throat> Some estimated, uh, have guesstimated that Saul would be somewhere just under seven foot tall. So even at that, he was still two foot, at least two foot tall, shorter than Goliath. Maybe even more, depending on how tall Goliath actually was. Still, you would think of all the men of the army, Saul would still be the best to fight Goliath. He's the tallest one, so he should stand up. The verse continues telling us more about this giant. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield-bearer went before him. So we are given a description of what his armor was like, and we find it pretty impressive indeed. A bronze helmet and a coat of male armor, which weighed, they say, approximately 78 pounds when we convert it. Because of his height, his legs would have been one of the most vulnerable parts, so he had them 
co covered with bronze armor also. Strapped to his back, between his shoulders, similar to a quiver of arrows, was a spear that was the size of a beam. Now, we don't know exactly what that is, but I think of a beam as like a four by four. Could have been smaller. <clears throat> and the head of it weighed about 17 pounds. And with all the armor and his great size, the narrative continues by saying, he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you will be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. For 40 days the Philistine came forward and took his stand, morning and evening. <clears throat> i go back. Now, we leave the battle lines for a moment to travel to another part of town, and we meet David, the son of Jesse. Now, David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem and Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to battle. And the names of the three sons who went to battle were Elib, the firstborn, and next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul. And David went back and forth from Saul to feed the sheep at Bethlehem. <clears throat> So we find that David had been somewhat of an errand boy running back and forth to the camp, from his father's house to the camp, taking things to the brothers who were in battle. And now, in not a not so unusual time, he is going again. And Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp of your, to your brothers. Also take these ten cheeses to the commander of the thousand. See if your brothers are well, and bring some token from them. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper, and took the provisions and went, as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage, and ran to the ranks, and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches, and will give him his daughter as, and make, him, make his father's house free in Israel. So they assumed the position on the battle line as they probably did each day. And again, Goliath comes out and the men scatter like mice. This time, David is there for, this, for his brothers and he overhears these words of Goliath. Here is a boy, too young for war and in the face of such a great danger. Yet his response is, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? <clears throat> when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent, be sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. From here, we pretty much know how the story goes. David makes a case about how he has fought and killed a lion and a bear while he is watching the sheep, and that he is confident he can take down this giant. Now, I'm a little shocked that Paul st Saul still would agree to let him go, even after this explanation about bears and, his bears and lions. But I guess the thrust of the words that helped convince Saul was when David said, Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. 
the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. It seems a bit shocking still that King Saul, the largest man in the company, with the very freedom of his own nation on the line, would still feel comfortable putting all of that at stake in the hands of this young boy. The story continues as we find David couldn't find suitable armor, nothing would fit him that was uh, suitable for that. So he takes his staff, a sling, and five smooth stones in his pouch. Goliath approaches, laughs, mocks, and curses at David. Then it is David's response that should be the battle cry for all of us when we are faced with overwhelming odds. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and with spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hand. And of course we know that he was triumphant, and indeed he took down the giant. So here's a young boy takes on an overwhelming obstacle based solely on his faith and trust in the protection of the Lord. He knew that if the Lord had given him victory as he stood against, alone against a lion and a bear, in a situation where the name and reputation of the Lord was not even at stake, that surely he would, he would bring victory when it was under attack. I am sure David grew up hearing the tales and becoming well-versed in the writings of Yahweh for from his forefathers and their battles in earlier times, like the story in Deuteronomy 20. When you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And when you draw near to the battle, the priest shall come forward and speak to the people and shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are drawing near for battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint. Do not fear or panic or be in dread of them. But the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you this, the victory. Then there's the story of Gideon from the book of Judges when God made it especially clear that the battle was not to be won by him but would, be won, would not be won by Gideon would, but, but, but by but Lord himself. When they came up against the Midianites, the army of Gideon numbered 22,000 troops. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. So Gideon told the people that whosoever was fearful, they should return home. And about 12,000 people departed, leaving the army down to 10,000. I guess there was a lot of scared people that day. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. And anyone of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. And anyone of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. <clears throat> and the number who, of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouths, were, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, With the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand, and let all the others go, every man, to his home. So with 300 men, Gideon went out and chased down the Midianites and destroyed them. The Lord had fought for his people numerous times in the past, with one of the largest, of course, when he brought him out of Egypt. Surely these stories were probably quite well known amongst all the tribes. Though one should question why Saul and those in the army did not have the same type of faith as David. Why was it that there was not one godly, confident man amongst them 
in the entire army that was willing to stand up in the name of the Lord. Of course, in reading the entire book of Samuel up to this point, you can see that their past had recently been filled with idolatry and all kinds of craziness. They had even you know, demanded to have a king, which is why Saul's in place. So they had done things that the Lord had told them not to do. And uh, so they had been pretty struggling up to this point. So I guess it's not too far, too hard to see that they're not too far from being having a disastrous past there. Now, when we consider David and his actions, we must remember why David took the actions to begin with. Author David uh, Peter Lightheart states it like this. Though the story of David and Goliath is popularly known as an example of a great underdog triumphing over great odds, the ex accent in the Bible biblical account is not on David's heroism or his glory. Of course, he did receive honor as the women sang his praises on his return from battle in, verse 18, in chapter 18, verse 7. But David's heroism was not like the heroism of an Achilles or an Odysseus. David did not fight because his honor had been violated, but to vindicate the honor of the Lord. David knew that you're not supposed to go to that slide. <clears throat> David knew that his Lord was all powerful and sovereign over all men, even the giant, and that while the Lord had the power to strike down the giant where he stood, without the aid of men, there are plenty of, plenty of stories in the Old Testament where the Lord required man to be faithful and act. And he would then grant them the victory. For the people of God, these things were not left up to chance, and they lived in the comfort of that in their faith. Since the time of David, we have additional stories of how the Lord has continued to do battle, like in 2 Chronicles 20. And he said, listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Israel, of Jerusalem, I'm going to a different place, and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but the Lord's, but God's. <clears throat> there are but a, these are but a few examples of the great and powerful sovereign Lord that Christians everywhere, even today, worship and follow. However, in today's age, and in today's age, acknowledging the sovereignty of God in all things is so misunderstood, ignored, or even outright denied and disbelieved. And so we find a church that is weakened and crippled by fear. Now this morning, I'm not going to go into a long discussion to prove the sovereignty of God because we know David pounds that into us pretty much every week. So I'm not going to rehash that now. I simply wish to discuss some of the effects of having and not having that type of faith in the sovereignty of the Lord. The scriptures tell us much about fear, and we are exhorted time and time again to cast out fear. Fear is a big enemy to the people, and it is fear that causes us to often ignore our duty and hope that someone else steps up to do it for us. There is only one kind of fear we should be striving to have, and that is the fear that will dispel all other fears and keep all things in a proper perspective. That one is the fear of the Lord. Probably the most well-known verse on the fear of the Lord for most Christians comes from both Proverbs and Psalms. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And from Psalms, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Even in Job, one of the supposedly earliest writings, uh, stories of the Bible, we were told the same thing. And he said to the man, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. And of course, the Lord warns on the flip side of this later in the chapter of Proverbs. If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called and you have refused to listen and have stretched out my, and stre have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded, because you have ignored all of my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you, when terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress comes upon you, and when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose to f the fear of the Lord, and would have none of my counsel, and despise all of my reproof. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way, and have their, own, have their fill of their own devices. 
for the simple are killed by the turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread and disaster. And in Malachi, we have a similar teaching as the Lord speaks about his judgment. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Now, when we speak of the fear of the Lord, it's not in a manner of dread or, or you know, uh, terror, as we might think of when we talk about fear. It's, uh, the word fear comes from a noun which is similar to the word reverend. So basically, fearing the Lord is to reverence him, to worship and acknowledge him as the one true Lord. Fearing the Lord in this manner produces love. Because we know that the Lord is on our side and protects the ones who revere and honor his name. We see in the First Testament, following, following after the declaration of the law of God in Deuteronomy 5, that the people are told, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might, and these words that I commanded you today shall be in your heart. Take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. <clears throat> the people were to love and obey the one true Lord, and in the same breath they should fear him. So love and fear are not so far apart that they cannot be reconciled, but in fact they should flow from one another when it comes to the Lord. If we love and fear him alone, what else have we to fear? In Kings, we see that the people are exhorted again to this reverence and worship. But you shall fear the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt with great power and with an outstretched arm. You shall bow yourselves to him and to him you shall sacrifice. The people are to worship and give reference, reverence only to the Lord, for he has done mighty works with them. The Lord promises peace to the nation if they continue to fear the Lord. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord, your God, it will be well. In the ancient world, there were many gods worshipped by the surrounding nations, and throughout the scriptures, we see that there are exhortations to give fear and reverence to only one God, and that is Yahweh our Lord. The first testament is filled with this reverential fear that he that is, brings to the people. But you shall fear the Lord your God, and he will deliver you out of the hand of all of your enemies. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. So what can we imply from this last verse, the steadfast, Lord, steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to those who fear him? Does that mean that to those who do not fear him, his everlasting love is not to them? But I thought God loved everyone. That is what most ch churches teach us, it seems. But I won't go into that path at this point because that could be a whole other sermon. So let's just look at a couple more verses from the, these also from the book of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, Proverbs 10, 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death, Proverbs 14, 27. The fear of the Lord leads to life, and, whoso, and whoever has it rests satisfied. He will not be visited by harm, Proverbs 19, 23. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. Now, with all the health and wealth, name it, claim it, market, park it, preachers out there, they claim that God wants you to be rich. I just wonder how many of them have ever connected their richness to the humility and fear of the Lord that we see here in Proverbs. As I just said, most churches teach nothing but the love of God and rarely teach on what it means to fear God. Now, admittedly, there are plenty of still hellfire and damnation type preachers out there pounding the pulpits, but that's not the type of fear that I'm talking about at this point. But generally, the mainline preachers 
only teach about love, love, love of God and never about any aspect of fear. After all, God is not to be feared for he is the one providing everything we have. And it's the devil who is out to get us at every turn, they say. So they blame every bad thing on Satan and attribute every good thing only to God. I assume they haven't read or understood the book of Job or even the works of Satan, uh, uh, where it speaks of the works of Satan being under the Lord's authority. But again, that's a whole other discussion. I would like to just mention two biblical stories, one from each testament, both ending in similar results. The first is from Leviticus 10 and the story of, a of two of Abra Aaron's sons who were just ordained as priests in the Lord's service. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And the fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me I will be sanctified, and before all the people I will be glorified. So we have two new priests, sons of Aaron, on their first duty in the temple. And what do they do? They stray from what they're supposed to do. Now, it says that they offered unauthorized fire, or I prefer, as the King James put it, as I grew up listening to, that they offered strange fire. Now, theologians have been back and forth about what the strange fire was and what made it unacceptable, etc. But without going into any details there, we just know that whatever it was about the fire, it was not appropriate for them to use it in the temple worship. God expects all the aspects of his service to be specifically what he has laid out, and this was obviously not what he had specified, and it cost them their lives. Then we jump to a familiar story in the book of Acts, which I know we've heard recently from this pulpit. <clears throat> but a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was, after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all of those who heard of it. Obviously Ananias lacked the fear of God, but the people around it, around him got it real quick. And as the story continues, about three hours later, here comes his wife, not knowing what has happened to her husband previously, and she repeats the lie and drops dead also. And, when, and then we are told again, and great fear came upon the whole church and upon all those who heard these things. Instead of fearing the Lord, this husband and wife feared what those around them might be thinking of them. And so they concocted this lie in order to impress those around them rather than seeking to impress God. So in both cases, Nadab and Abihu and this case here, the lives were lost when they crossed the Lord, and that, of course, is a fearful thing. In both cases, the wrong was committed and a lack of fear on the part of the involved parties could be partly to blame. May we always take heed that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, as we are told in Hebrews. Now, while I do not want this to become an entire message now on fear, I do feel it is obligatory to at least show the same type of language, since we talked about a lot of the fear in the Old Testament, the First Testament there, that we will see how it is in the Newer Testament. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you, shall, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Let Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love your brotherhood, fear God. Honor the emperor. That one's I'm sure David's going to cover when he gets into Romans 13. So I want to expound that for you right now. All right. <clears throat> the fear of the Lord is what we should be living under. Fear that drives us to reverence, awe, and love, and a worship of the one true Lord. Fear that knows we serve the Lord that rules over all mankind. 
over the actions of everyone from rulers down to animals. Each step is guided by a supreme hand that loves those who fear him. When we live in this fear, we shall have no need to fear anything around us. Now at this point, I'd like to jump forward in time from what we were just reading about and take a look at a character that's not too far removed from our history and show how his faith and belief caused him to do his duty with little to no fear. On January 24th, 1824, Thomas Jonathan Jackson was born in Clarksville, Virginia. And at the age of three, he became an orphan and was bounced around between relatives and other homes. At age 18, he entered into West Point and began his training for what would make him well known in history. While at school there, another of his fellow cadets shared with him the gospel message. For some, times af for some time afterwards, he investigated Christianity and eventually made his pr public profession of faith at the Presbyterian Church in Lexington, Virginia. After he went on to serve with distinction in the Mil Mexican War and eventually became a teacher at the Vil Virginia Military Institute where he had taught, and he eventually became a teacher where he taught from 1851 to 1861. On Sunday, April 21st, 1861, he and his cadets received orders to join the Confederate Army. He and his wife knelt in the bedroom and prayed. And afterward, afterwards, he stood up, marched out, never to return home again. Thomas had become quite a student of the Bible and believing that every need in life could be met through it. Many of his military strategies that made him famous have been taken right out of the book of Joshua. He read the Bible and lived as a life as much as he could with what was contained within it. Those who fought with him said he lives by the New Testament and fights by the Old. As he read his Bible, or as his wife read it to him, he would often stop and underline passages. That Bible is now preserved in a museum, and you can see his underline, the underlining had matched how he had sought to live. During the war, he sought to, pro to always provide a good example to those under his command, and he witnessed to them also, leading many of them to the message of life and salvation. Thomas was a man of prayer, never entering a battle without first praying, and many give testimony of his praying during the battles. He said prayer had become a habitual permanent fixture in his life. Thomas had a strong, unshakable belief in the sovereignty of God, that God is always in control, even when it seems the world around us is falling apart. At the bat first battle of Bull Run, while shells and bullets were flying around him, Thomas stayed on his horse and remained calm and collected like nothing was going on. Brigadier General Bernard B. saw this and told his troops, there stands Jackson like a stone wall. Men, let's determine to die with him here. Af after the battle, Tom Jackson's brigade became, became known as the Stonewall Brigade and he would forever be known as Stonewall Jackson. Jackson's courage and composure really came out in this great battle. During the heat of the battle, a messenger came and handed Jackson a letter to sign. He dismounted, and when he did, a cannonball blew off the tree next to him. Wood chips rained down on everything, and without missing a step, he brushed the wood chips away from the paper and continued reading. He then mounted his horse like nothing had happened. Jack, uh, Others saw this and were amazed at his composure when danger was all around him. Someone asked him how he could do it. Jackson's reply was right on. And if you are one that lives in fear of those things around you, if people are bigger to you than God is, then I pray that you'll take to heart Jackson's words because they are true, biblical, and reliable. Jackson answered, My religious beliefs teach me that I am just as safe on the battlefield as I am in my bed. The Lord has already appointed the day of my death, so I need not worry about that. I live my life and prepare myself so I will always be ready to meet my Lord when death does overtake me. If we rest in the sovereignty of the Lord, what else do we have to fear? If we believe all is under his control and providence and nothing can be done to change that path, then what can we possibly fear or seek to change by our fear? For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control, as we are told in 2 Timothy 1.7. So as Christians, we do not have a spirit of fear, but of love and control. 
we can march forth into life knowing that while the battle is the Lord's, we are the instruments by which he has established to take down the Goliaths around us. However, instead of this peace in the face of fear, most people today have no fear of God, and so they fear for their own lives most every day. Now, it was about mm, five or six weeks ago that uh, David first approached me, told me he was going out of town and that he needed me to cover. And so at the time, I was pondering about what to speak on. And actually, this topic, which is something um, I have, had gleaned some stuff from a previous message I had heard, I decided to go that route. But then, I don't know, about a week or so after that, some other things happened that made me change my mind and to go a different direction. And then a couple weeks later, which was just a couple weeks ago, the news was filled with the horrible tragedy, and it brought me back to this initial message that I had initially contemplated. The news, <clears throat> the news event that I speak of is, of course, the, not of course, but is, is the one that happened in Aurora, Colorado, when James Holmes opened fire on the movie crowd the opening night of the new Batman movie. Now, before I go any further, this is not really, this is a great tragedy. It's a horrible situation. I'm not saying anything to, to make light of that at all, and actually, what I'm saying really doesn't have as much to do with the event that happened as much as it does just using that as an example of an event that happens. We have these type of events all the time. It's not really directly related to that. But it, that event caused me to kind of rethink some of the things, and it brought me back to the direction of discussing this topic. <clears throat> I have not followed the story, and like I said, it, the details of it since then are not necessarily relevant to this point. Um, as the news reported, the man entered a theater and at some point exited, went to the emergency door, opened him up where he had awaited a stash of weapons. He re-entered the theater, tossed a gas grenade into the theater, and entered wearing a gas mask and started shooting into the unsuspecting audience. Some witnesses who reported, had reported that the shooter slowly stalked the aisles of the theater, shooting people at random as panicked moviegoers, movie watchers in the packed auditorium tried to escape. One survivor that I saw on the news stated, I froze up. I was scared. I honestly thought I was going to die. Now, I was not there, and I've only heard some of these reports, and there's a lot of details and things that have not been read. But it made me wonder about the event, which is why I'm using it as an example. If we just look at the situation in general, I couldn't help but think um, if the, of the men in the theater, were there none that feared the Lord and didn't just fear their own safety. Out of the hundred people or more in the theater, you would expect at least one, if not an entire mob of people, would just go after this one man that was coming against them. Instead, in these types of cases, fear grips them, fear for their own lives, and they, pan they are panicked and they flee, kind of like the armies of Israel fleeing before Goliath. It just made me think of how much fear has become so prevalent in the hearts of men these days, and how the fear of the Lord, which leads to courage and fighting for protection, has dissipated in general. I mean, you hear the stories in years gone past of the bravery, and you still hear stories of bravery. It's not knocking that. People still risk their lives. But, you know, it's, maybe it's just the, it's the stories from our the storybooks of old where you hear the people standing up and fighting for their rights. And just, you know, tales of bravery. Seems like we don't have as many of those. I, I, the same type of thing made me wonder, you know, about the whole 9-11 plane crashes. You figure there's this plane and people on there, and there's a couple people with knives, and you think the whole people could just mob them and take them over. So, but it happens in all situations. You see on TV, and you got ransoms and stuff, and people, you know, hold a knife to your throat, and everybody kind of panics, and so there's no, uh, nothing is done. Um, I mean, if they attack, sure, somebody might get hurt, but I'm sure it would probably end in a lot less people. But anyway. People seem to have lost the knowledge of what God's word tells us when he says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 27, 1. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Psalm 56, 11. Now, of course, I cannot fully blame them for their inaction and, and this mentality of fear. For that's pretty much the type of people that have been planned for about the past 150 years or so. One of the last major rebellious acts uh, against tyranny and oppression, one of the major battles for truth and freedom, took place in the middle of the 19th century, properly referred to as the war between the states. 
and is most commonly known now by the inaccurate title of the Civil War. We talked about Stonewall Jackson, and he was one of those people. Following the war, the government thinkers and humanistic educators knew that in order to prevent a future war of such magnitude, where the people would take up arms and fight against the government tyranny, the government of tyranny, they needed to weed out the spirit of truth and justice and to replace it with submission and passivity in the people. The way they sought out to do this was through compulsory state education systems. You see, up until then, little, up until a little while before that time, our country did not have any state-sponsored public schools. In the 1620s, when the Pilgrims and Puritans came to the country seeking religious freedom, they were products of the Protestant Reformation. So, for the roughly 220 years from 1620 to 1840, American education had a distinctly moral character and stemmed from an almost entirely Christian and Calvinistic orientation. In America, education was seen as always including religious principles. And we find plainly stated in the definition, as we find plainly stated in the definition of the word education, as found in the first American dictionary, which was Noah Webster's 1828 edition. Education, the bringing up as of a child, instruction, formation of manners. Education comprehends, <laughs> okay, anyway, um, manners. Uh, education comprehends all that series of instruction and discipline which is intended to enlighten the understanding correct the temper, and form the manners and habits of youth, and fit them for usefulness in their future stations. To give children a good education in manners, arts, and science is important. To give them a religious education is indispensable. And an immense responsibility rests on parents and guardians who neglect these duties. The reformer Martin Luther, even back in his time and country, plainly stated, I am much afraid that schools will prove to be great gates of hell unless they diligently labor to explain the Holy Scriptures, engraving them in the hearts of the youth. I advise no one to place his child where the Scriptures do not reign paramount. Every institution in which men are not increasingly occupied with the Word of God must become corrupt. Luther's sentiment is what the American settlers held to in their thoughts on education. Even the early American colleges, like Harvard, were started and based upon orthodox Christian principles. Harvard's original mission statement was, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of life and studies, that the main end of life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, and therefore to lay Christ at the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. Even Daniel Webster, not to be confused with Noah Webster, who I just quoted from the dictionary, he was a politician that was admired for about 40 years back in the, he was a politician for 40 years back in the early 1800s. He said, in what age, by what sect, where, where, when, and by whom has religious truth been excluded from the education of youth? Nowhere, never, everywhere, and at all times it has been and is regarded as essential. It is of the essence the vitality of useful instruction. The great Southern Presbyterian theologian Robert Louis Dabney, who served as one of the chaplains under the army of Stonewall Jackson for a time, said this at the time when the public education system was beginning to rear its ugly head in the states. The Yankees have had this nostrum of free school education in full force for two generations. Now nostrum, for those who don't know that, it's a term that they used to mean it was a medicine that was sold by false or exaggerated claims and had no demonstrable value or it was considered to be quack medicine. So he's saying that the education is quack, not even, not true, not valid. Did not this very system rear up that, that very generation which in its blind ignorance and brutal passion has recently wrecked the institutions of America, has filled our country with destitution woe and murder, and with a stupid blindness only equaled by its wickedness, has stripped its own commonwealths in order to wreak its mad spite on ours of the whole safeguards for their own freedom and peace. <clears throat> These are the fruits of this Yankee system of state primary education. Nothing against you Yankees, I'm sorry. That's what he said. Anyway, 
I, <laughs> I have not yet learned enough of this type of intelligence which this system seems to foster to repudiate my Savior's infallible maxim, the tree is known by its fruit. <clears throat> so Dabney sees that because of the state education system in the North prior to the war, it had, it had been in the northern states for many years, or for at least a generation, that that whole generation of people rose up to fight a war that destroyed much of the foundations of America's values. Of course, the sentiment, this sentiment is further enforced when we consider a conversation that was had between Daniel Webster, who I just mentioned, and two Virginians. This was years before the war. The story is related by Dabney, where he states, <clears throat> I don't think I have that in here, Webster's return towards an impartial cor course has gained him some respect in the South, and my two friends said had paid respects to him. While conversing with them, he fixed his dark eyes on them and with great earnestness, earnestness asked, can't you southern gentlemen consent with some sort of inducement or plan to surrender slavery? They replied, replied firmly, not to the inter interference or dictations of the federal government. And this not on account of mercenary or motives, but because to allow outside interference in this vital manner would forfeit the liberties and other rights of the South. Webster said, are you fixed in that? They replied, yes, unalterably. Well, he said with an awful solemnity, I cannot say you are wrong, but if you are fixed in that, go home and get ready your weapons. They asked him, what on earth did he mean? He replied that the parsons and the common school teachers and school marms had diligently educated an entire northern generation into a passionate hatred of slavery, and who would, as, certain as, as certainly as destiny, attack Southern institutions. So that if Southern men were determined not to surrender their institutions, they had better prepare for war. Thus, according to Mr. Webster, the crimes, woes, and horrors of the last 15 war years of the war between the states are all partly due to the school system. Many of the great minds behind the indoctrination system felt that it was the difference in the education level between the classes of men that caused great evil in the world. And that if the education of the masses was more leveled, it would remove evil from society. European scholar George Hegel and Scotsman Robert Dale Owen, often referred to as the father of socialism, came in with a whole new idea for education. They believed that the basic tenets of the Christian religion hindered man's evolution. Some in this camp believed that with the proper education and the eradication of religion, man could evolve to eliminate the evil in the world. A colleague of Owen states the following, and I haven't kept up with this. The great object was to get rid of Christianity and to convert our churches into halls of science. The plan was not to make open attacks on religion, although we might belabor the clergy and bring them into contempt where we could, but to establish a system of state, or we say national, schools from which all religion would be excluded and to which all parents were to be compelled by law to send their children. By the turn of this century, actually it would be last century now that I think about it because now we're in a new century. By the turn of the 1900s, these fellows had in heavily influenced American educators like John Dewey and his colleagues. They sought to change America through public education. Knowing that they could not sway the mature adults from their views, they sought instead to change the future generation by re-educating our children. They, shot, they thought to change the nation, once high in literacy, by shifting the education system from emphasizing intellectual and academic skills to rather emphasizing social skills. Get them to deal with activities rather than the mind. This leads to the eventual addition of psychology to the school system, which of course has happened to our, in our time. Socialist H.G. Wells stated it truthfully in his 1933 book, The Shape of Things to Come, when he said, no revolution could be a real and assured revolution until it has completely altered the educational system of the community. In 1918, the book, The Secret that the Science of Power by Benjamin Kidd is printed, in which he declares, the main cause of those, deeply, of those deep dividing differences which separate peoples and nationalities and classes from each other, and which prevent or stullify collective efforts in all 
its most powerful forms. Stellify, by the way, means to rend feudal, in case you didn't know that. Could all be swept away if civilization put before itself the will to impose on the young the ideal of subordination to the common aims of organized humanity. It can only be imposed in all its strength through the young. So to impose it has become the chief end of education in the future. And he goes on to say, Oh, you blind leaders who seek to convert the world by labor disputations, step out of the way or the world must fling you aside. Give us the young. Give us the young and we will create a new mind and a new earth in a single generation. Qu Kid quotes Masonic Carborinari leader Giuseppe Mazzini, who lived in the 1800s, in this regard, who stated, your task is to form the universal family. Education, this is the great word that sums up, sums up our whole doctrine. Kidd refers to Mazzini's distinction that education is addressed through emotion to the moral faculties in the young and instruction to the intellectual faculties. And Kidd claims power centers in emotion. Well, it has now been over a hundred years since all of these things were put into place. And if you look back, you can see radical changes in this nation alone over that time. Little by little, generation by generation, the inner desire for truth and justice and the inner fight has slowly dwindled just as it was expected under this education system. Through a series of indoctrinational methods and in the stripping of the Lord out of the classroom, they churn out more and more students of the state. Well, without turning this into a giant expose on education, let's begin to close by saying that hopefully you can see the connection between how in past times the fear of the Lord, which included bravery and the understanding and responding to duty, was more prevalent and how that has been slowly on a downward spiral for the past hundred years or so. This can be seen to coincide with a concerted effort to educate it out of the people if you simply read the history of the education system's founding. And for all intent and purposes, it, has, it is fair to say that they have succeeded in their goal, turning more and more Americans into sheep that can be led around, never questioning the moves or motives of the leaders, never calling them to, into account, and of course never rebelling or taking action against them. This education has also removed the words of God from the lives of men, and instead of being an integral part of education as it should be, why did that happen? All right, no, nothing on there. Anyways. Ignore the screens. Um, <clears throat> uh, just, while kids spending, with the kids spending the majority of their daytime hours under this education system, and parents spending less and less time providing religious education in their off hours, it is no wonder why the fear of God is gone. Add to that the modern church's fascination with health, wealth, and the love of God while ignoring the deeper things like the fear of the Lord and the doctrine of total sovereignty. Add to that the faulty view of eschatology and an escapist attitude in that realm, and it is no surprise that the church has become pretty much stagnant and obsolete today. Why has this gone off? <clears throat> Reports show that uh, more and more people who have been regular attendees in church for many years are leaving the organized church each year. And more and more children who are brought up in Christian homes leave the faith entirely by their college years. Most churches have an average sermon length of about 20 minutes. So the people get pep talks avoid, devoid of any substance or teaching. And with less and less people engaging in reading of great theological works or even their very own Bibles, it's no wonder the church is in the state of 10. Oh, the computer got too hot. Why do I do that? Anyway. All of that combined produces a generation more ignorant and fearful than the last, creating more people who are easily herded where needed and rarely question or push back against injustice and wickedness in our own lives, society, or government. This was all by design. And as long as Christians support this free education system, it will continue to be the case. As long as Christians refuse to read their own Bible and dig into it, 
this will continue to happen. As long as Christians put up with mediocre churches that teach little to nothing about the depths of the whole Bible, this will continue to be the case. As long as Christian parents leave it solely up to the school or to the church to provide their children with religious training, this will continue to be the case. So in closing, we need to consider first that as Christians who follow a living God, we have not been given a fear. <clears throat> We've not been given a spirit of fear, but I didn't want to do questions yet. <clears throat> Get over here. Not been given a spirit of fear, but one of security and reliance in our sovereign Lord. Our duty is to stand up against whatever Goliath comes forth in our life, standing for truth, justice, and in love for others, and make sure that we teach that to our children. But they, for they will not get it anywhere else. When we come up against an obstacle, we are not to turn in fear, but we are to do, as our, du do our duty and to rest assured that whatever the outcome, it was all we could do because the battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. Now, then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We pray, Lord, that you would bring about change in the lives of your people all across the nation, that you would have them to honor, fear, and stand in all of your greatness, your sovereignty, and the love that you share. But Lord, help us always to have a well-rounded theology of understanding your attributes. We pray that you would help us this day, Lord, to take what we have heard, take the uh, stories we've heard from the voice of the martyrs and just apply it all to our lives, Lord, that we would read your word, that we would teach it to those around us, that we would teach your people and our children, that we would instill in them the fear of thee, that you would help us to restore that balance that is needed in all of our lives, Lord. Help us to honor you in all that we do. We pray in Jesus' name.